Hi everyone, Bill Fairman with Carolina Capital Management. Uh, Wendy is not with us today. We are not letting her come in. <laughs> she, she had uh, some other things to do. Jonathan Davis is with us today. He is uh, actually the guy that does all the work around here. Wendy and I just smile and talk a lot. So don't forget to like, subscribe, thumbs up. What, what else? Contrary to my age, I'm not that hip with the, with the technology. <laughs> That's right. You're a millennial. You're supposed to know all that social stuff. <laughs> By the way, we do have a fund, and we would love people that are accredited investors to check it out. It's carolinahardmoney.com. Go to the investor tab, fill out a form, and schedule an appointment, and, and we'll talk it over. Now, we are a lending uh, fund only, and we lend money to other people. You get a return. <laughs> anyway, we had the pleasure of having uh, Bob. Geez, Bob, I'm sorry. I, I messed up your last name. Help me. Malecki. Malecki. I've been saying it like for 20 minutes. <laughs> and as soon as I'm supposed to say it, I forget it. I hear you. By the way, forgive me. I flew from the West Coast to the East Coast yesterday, and we were through the daylight savings change as well. So I'm suffering from jet lag, not to mention old age. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Bob is in the note business and you know, we're in the note business as well. And the difference is we create new notes and Bob deals in notes that have already been created. And Bob, uh, g give us a kind of a background, how you got into that business and, and then we'll talk about uh, uh, current things. Absolutely, Bill. Thanks for having me on, by the way. I started, I think, in 2013 or so. I was a house flipper. I owned some rentals. Been involved in real estate since about 2000, late 2006 or so. And one of my agents on a, who helps me liquidate my flips, she was buying mobile homes and repositioning those. And she found a couple in Sammamish, Washington. I'm, I'm near Seattle. I'm on the west side and Sammamish is on the east side. And they wanted to sell their note. They had a note on a mobile home that they sold to another couple. And they, these, these folks were moving to Arizona to retire. And, but they needed the cash and they needed to sell it fast. And so Deb, Deb contacted me and connected me with this couple. And, and the note was only $14,500 or so. But I offered them seven thousand or seventy five hundred for purchase, fifty percent on it, and they they accepted that. And when I did the math on the monthly payments over, I think it was a five year. In fact, it just got paid off or finished it, but it, it ended up being about a forty percent return on my money. And I bought wow. it my IRA, and it kind of hit me in the head. I've I've gone to our RIA, RIA meetings where Eddie Speed has shown up and talked about notes. I couldn't understand why he was talking about notes, and now it finally hit me. So I bought the note in the IRA and collected the cash flow, and that got me really going on learning more about distressed mortgage debt, which is what I do. I buy distressed debt and reposition it with the borrowers, get them reperforming if possible, and and it really magnifies the return. So. Over the past, what is that, seven years or so, I, I stopped flipping homes about three years ago. The market turned over here. It made no sense anymore. I've actually sold off a few of my rentals. My standing joke is that I have a tenant who pays me money every month and leaves me alone. And I realize that those are called borrowers, you know, and it really made more sense for cash flow to have a borrower paying me money on a monthly basis than a renter. Although there's not as many tax breaks doing it in my IRA made a lot of sense. And since then, I started two private equity funds. The first was no, uh, Resolution Capital Management, which is bought, acquires first position, non-performing debt. We raised a few million dollars. We're in the third year of a five-year closed-ended fund. And we're, we've got about 95% of the loans reperforming or liquidated one or the other. And that was great. It was it was an opportunity for me to partner. I've, I've got a partner, Kevin Moen, in Seattle and Ben Cote in San Francisco, and uh, we work virtually. We use FCI for our, our uh, servicing. From there, I met my, my partner now, Josh Andrews and Scott Ruzich, 
and they approached me about back in 2017, late 2017, they wanted to start a private equity fund to buy distressed mortgage debt. So I consulted with them for, well, it took us about nine months to construct the fund and put everything together. But by the time that we got everything put together, they invited me to, to be a partner with them, a third third party partner and run the fund. And so we launched that in uh, spring of 2018. And that fund uh, is a little bit different in that we're buying primarily second position, distressed debt, HELOCs, that kind of thing. In markets, you know, if we can control the acquisition, we buy small pools from hedge funds. But the ideal loan for us is a uh, appreciating market where the borrower is, uh, is current and paying on their first position note. And there's equity above the first and our, our second position note. And for those kinds of loans, we're finding that those borrowers are very willing to come to the table for a loan mod, or if the balance is pretty low, they'll just pay it off and refinance their, themselves out of the first and get a lower rate. So it's been a really a, a good time in the economy to have second position notes in most markets where it's appreciating. And we're continuing to run that fund through 2023. It's a closed ended private equity fund under Reg D. 50, what is it? 506B, I believe. Mm -hmm. So when, when you raise the capital in these funds, are you, you in other words, it's a closed end fund. So you're raising the capital and you're buying all the notes at one time. And then you have a five year workout or you're buying them in different phases. Uh, it's a, it basically as we acquire the capital, then we deploy that into assets. So it's a rolling deployment, so to speak. Okay. And then the and the and the fund is so whoever comes in in year three basically has two years left of preferred return paid out to them. It does not. Some funds will do a five year where you the, the first day you engage with the fund, it's five years before you get your money back. Ours is basically cumulative. Okay, nice. So you're you're constantly raising money through the entire closed into term. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So you didn't do like a capital raise and then then move into it. You were going on the whole time. Better yeah, exactly. It's fun. Yeah, and what we found is because I'm fairly popular on a, a forum called Bigger Pockets, I've had a pretty good following, and we ended up in our first year and a half raising two point five million dollars, and now we're we have a five million dollar cap, so we're continually raising as we go along. And you know, the first what I'm finding too is the first position distressed mortgage debt from two thousand eight. That that inventory has pretty much really shrunk a lot. I'm not seeing a lot of viable assets that we can acquire and, and reposition for a reasonable return. So that's good that we're winding down resolution capital, but with notable capital management, my partner Josh has got some very good connections with asset managers that he's worked with over the past six years. And there's still quite a bit of inventory on distressed second position debt. People get scared when uh, you talk about second mortgage positions, but you're getting those for a lot less money. And it's all, absolutely it's also a longer, a little longer term play. Most people are going to want to get in involved in the, the, the refinances and you can't do that. If you have a second position lien, you, you have to, no, you're not going to subordinate. <laughs> right. So they have to work out something with you. Right. Yeah, yeah, and and what we're finding is only about three percent of the of the assets in our portfolio we're actually going to foreclosure on, which is a good thing because we, you know, both in both funds, foreclosure obviously is not good for the borrower, but it's also quite a quite a disruption for the fund because it entails obviously more expense for us for from the fund. And then the risk of getting the asset back and not knowing what's inside the house can be kind of surprising sometimes. And, and it can, can, we can actually lose money on some notes because the condition of the house is just so bad that we can't resell that asset as, a, as an REO and recapitalize at a profit. Right. Well, I'm going to, someone who just bought a house that has all kind of stuff in it, uh, he knows what you're talking about. Um, yeah. It had a, yeah, but, uh, had a nice uh, raccoon in there. That, that was, that was, yeah, nice there you surprise. go. <laughs> <laughs> but see, your number, and, and I want to stress this to the audience out here. Your goal when you're buying distressed notes is not to foreclose, 
it is to try and work out a deal because you're getting it at such a discount that you have the, the power to go in there and renegotiate the terms and still make uh, good money, turn them into performing assets mm -hmm. and then turn around and sell them to somebody that is looking for a performing loan. Right. Exactly. I have two questions. If, if you yeah, go ahead. Yeah. One is what is your typical CLTV constraint when you're going into this? I mean, it's probably, you know, market driven, I'm sure. But then, you know, my other question is if you're in second position and you're going into foreclosure, what's the workout process with the first lien holder and how does that work? You know, because there's a chance that your lien can be extinguished through the foreclosure process. So what, what are you all doing there? Well, yeah, I mean, strategically, and, and my partner, Josh, really runs that portion. But from my background and working with him in this fund, you know, if there's equity, then the extinguishment through the court system is pretty minimal. If there's not equity, if the, if the combined loan to value of the CLTV is higher than the, the value of the home, we may not foreclose. We may sit and spin on that one because yeah. we don't want to risk ex extinguishment. If there is equity and we foreclose and the first is sitting there and it was pay, being paid, then we would typically take over the, the first payments and then liquidate the property as quickly as possible to pay off that first. Because once we foreclose mm -hmm. from second position, we are now the new owners of the property, so mm -hmm. to speak. Although the liability for that first is still towards the borrower, the former owner of the house, that we don't want that first foreclosing on us as the new, new quote unquote owners, so to speak. Gotcha. Okay. Nice. So I'm biased because I'm also in the loan business or note business, but I like the fact that when you have a note that you are in control of the asset without being responsible for the asset. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we talked about tax benefits of owning property and the importance of uh, having as many of your notes in a tax deferred or tax exempt uh, vehicle. You, you want to ex expand on that a little bit? Can people buy notes from you at all? Or Sure, uh, sure. Yeah, right now we're not selling much of our portfolio. Our goal is to keep it in, keep all the assets, as many of the assets in the portfolio as possible so that when we liquidate at the end of the term of the fund, we have a performing portfolio that we can sell off and we're buying these notes because they're second position. We're picking them up for around 30 cents on the dollar. So the value increase, the equity we have in the notes when they're performing and rolling along is, is pretty immense. We do occasionally sell a note to recapitalize for various reasons. And we do have a list uh, that people join on our website and they can buy, you know, directly from us. But to get back to the self-directed IRA retirement accounts, you know, we, we do take capital from investors through their IRA and we don't use any leverage in the fund. Usually if a fund like a, a syndication would probably have up to 70% leverage on a syndication, when a self-directed IRA comes in as an investor, they're are exposed to the UDFI, which is on, what is it? Unrealized debt financed income. Right. And they could actually be responsible for paying some tax on that and on yeah. that money they invested on the return they're getting. So we were unleveraged and basically the self-directed IRA custodian, we work with them onboarding their client's investment into the fund. And then that, that client is treated alongside the same as any non-self-directed IRA. The nice thing about that, and I think Bill, behind your question is, is the income is straight just straight income. There's no tax sheltering. If you own a property in your IRA, you're going to have, or, no, or not, not in your IRA, a property is going to give you some tax sheltering benefits, depreciation and so forth. But if you own a note outside of your IRA, it's straight income and you're going to pay income tax on that. Whereas in an IRA, having the note makes much more sense because mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're on a Roth, you're not going to pay any income on that. It'll grow your, your capital income will cut the, the P&I payments will grow that IRA. Yeah. yeah. I always tell people, if you're going to in invest in this space, use your tax deferred or tax exempt vehicles to invest in the lending side of things, and then use your cash to buy properties with, or invest in funds that own property. Cause at least 
in a fund that owns property, they'll pass through those depreciation benefits and stuff through to you. And, and you're not, be, you're not able to take advantage of it in an IRA because you're already tax deferred or tax exempt. Uh, That's but, true. Well, I think there's certain circumstances where you could utilize the tax benefits, even in an IRA. For instance, if you did have, you're invested in a, um, in a syndication where you are subject to some UDFI tax, I, I believe, and I'm not an accountant, so don't, don't take my word for it, but I believe that then the tax benefits might, might be beneficial. And you're, you're, you are correct. And I'm not an accountant either. So let's make all that clear. <laughs> I've heard from others <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that you can offset that tax because that tax is only charged on the profit. So if you do right. have some depreciation in there, that eliminates some of that paper profit. Uh, that you would have to pay the, the, the tax on. Uh, and, but in reality, if you do have a self-directed IRA and you are subject to some sort of a tax, be thankful you're still making money. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and it's going to be less tax than you normally would pay. Well, it's a higher tax, but it's a smaller percentage of your actual tax. So... Yeah. If you're making money, you're going to pay money to somebody eventually, right? <laughs> sure seems the case. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so are your notes uh, nationwide? Yes. Yeah. We buy in every state. We obviously try to stay away from the long foreclosure states like New York, New Jersey, and, and Florida, but we're agnostic, so to speak. We buy based on combined loan to value equity. Is there, you know, I explained what our ideal one is. So even if it's a note in New Jersey that but has a lot of equity above both both notes, we would still acquire that because we figure that the chances of borrower working with us and not defaulting is pretty high because they have equity. Yeah. Sure. I started working at a at a company where that's what we did. We we bought and and, and sold notes. And uh, when I left four years later, there were several notes that were in foreclosure in Kings County, New York, that were there when I started and were still there when I left Yeah, <laughs> four years later. So yeah, I, I get the, the hesitance in those markets. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say one of, one of the notes I bought in my IRA, I bought from Gemini. This was back, I don't know, five years ago, six years ago. I bought it in my IRA and it was in New Jersey and it was already in foreclosure and it was a condo, like a townhome. Uh, vacant, the borrower, I believe had passed away. And even after, and it was in foreclosure at least six months when I bought it, and it still took over a year, almost a year and a half to foreclose on it and get it out and get it. I think we, yeah, we ended up bus selling it at the auction, but the good news is the property had appreciated more and there was, it was so underwater that we just kept, you know, as, as it went on, even though it cost us money for, for fees, servicing fees, and there was some overhead costs, we ended up making a pretty good amount of money on it just because the property appreciated with the market. So sometimes that timing is good, but mm -hmm. in a down market, obviously it's pretty bad. Yeah. So as opposed to loan sales and loss mitigation, when, when we say loss mitigation, I, I mean, you know, working, working the loans out to get them reperforming, I guess, what's the percentage of loss mitigation do you all, are you effective with? Because I, I imagine it's fairly high, isn't it? What do you mean by percentage of loss mit though? I mean, everything goes into loss mit. Well, yeah, of, of successful loss mit. So, so actually getting them either loan modified or, or reinstated in some, yeah. some way. Yeah, currently in the notable fund, we're at about a 45%, a portfolio is 45% reperforming and 55% non. Yeah. yeah. And part of that is because we're just, kind of working through the, the lower hanging fruit. So we're getting the best ones re, repositioned and the loss mit complete. And so that's that's a bit skewed in that if all loans being equal, I don't know if we'd still be at a 40 to 50, we might be even higher, but you know, mm. it's just a matter of getting everything through our pipeline. That's great. Those, those, those are good numbers. Yeah. yeah. So I, I did finally remember what I was going to say. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you the jet lag is killing me. Oh yeah. Having notes all over the country helps you diversify in different parts of the country because we all know that real estate is is local mm -hmm. yep. and you know while one part of the country might be suffering a little bit there's other parts that are still increasing in value and, and having notes that are diversified geographically helps the fund diversify the risk 
and just like you, you were saying in the Seattle area, you, you can't do fix and flip there. You can't find properties cheap enough to make a profit. And the, the municipality there has made it so difficult to build new. It, it's very difficult to go in and, and, and do new housing as well. So it was a smart move moving to the, to the note side of things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's the, the diversification and doing different States is, you know, helps mitigate some risk because when I talk about all these, you know, a lot of the notes in our portfolio have a, a equity above the CLTV and you know, our, our, a prospective investor will say, what happens during a downturn? What happens when there's a recession and we're going to have one? And I said, well, the good news is, you know, different states, different cities will have a downturn at different rates. So first of all, it's not going to be a, an even recession in our portfolio. Also, I, at least from my perspective, homeowners who have equity will tend to stick around in that house and not stop paying their mortgage just because maybe one of the spouses lost their job or they, they've got a lower income. Also, because we're targeting loans with a, a substantial equity above the CLTV, even if the house depreciates 10%, we're still covered for the most part on the average. Excellent. I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people say, well, you know, why would you buy a note that has gone into default? You know, you're buying notes from bums. That, that's not really yeah. the case. No one goes into borrowing money with the intention of not paying it back. It can be all kind of things. And what's going on right now with the, the coronavirus scare, there, there's a reason why people would default on a second right there, loss of a job for a certain period of time, right? Yeah. But also on, in that same respect, they might be more apt to be telecommuting rather than commuting to their job. So they'd want to keep their home and stay in it. So they have sure. a place to work, you know, That's a great point. the two. Yeah, but, but, but if they have a short term period where they don't have any money to, to make that payment, they're, they're typically, and what's really unusual and typically they'll pay their second because the payment is lower <laughs> and they, they don't pay their first because it's higher, which makes no sense to me. But, at the same time, it's usually a temporary loss of employment or it's a temporary illness that get people into this position in the first place. And it's a whole lot easier to work those notes back out again down, down the line, don't you think? It is, it is. And again, the discount you can buy the note at gives you more flexibility on that loss mitigation and the workout you do because, you know, let's say a borrower their, their unpaid balance is $60,000 and we were able to pick it up for $20,000. We've got $40,000 of equity, so to speak, to work with with them. So we amortize their loan over a new period. We can lower their rate. We have a few tools we can work with to make it work it out with them so that it works for them financially and we still make a good return on our investment on that asset. So it's a kind of a win-win for, for everybody. Nice. So Bob, give me your, your website or how you would like other people to contact you about your fund. Absolutely. It's www, of course, notablefund.com. That's N-O-T-A-B-L-E-F-U-N-D.com. And my email is bob at notablefund.com. Be happy to do a call, whatever, if you want to learn more about notes or if you're interested in coming into the fund, uh, we're still open for investments. We have a fixed preferred return between eight and 12%, depending on the investment amount, and it's paid quarterly. Okay, now are you taking accredited investors only? Uh, no, it's open to both accredited and non-accredited. It's a, it's a 506B, which allows us a limited amount of non-accredited investors as well. Okay, well, this would be a great opportunity for me to say, we are not selling or any <laughs> investment. You must read your PPM before you invest. Uh, That's right. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> I love the note space. Yes. Uh, again, we're, we're basically in the same space. We're just in it at different times of the, uh, of the process. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I find it's wonderful. It, it's, it provides for, for me personally in my IRA, it provides me the ability to create cash flow without the overhead of owning property and tenants, trash toilets and, real estate agents and contractors and all the fun stuff that comes with that. Raccoons. Um, yeah, and you, can, you can run it, you know, run it in your pajamas, so to speak, because it's essentially just telephone, email, 
I've never been to a property that we bought a note on. I don't care to be. There is a lot of field resources you can deploy. So the banks have created a great industry for themselves in doing loans. And then we can tag on to their resources on the back end when we need to perform loss mitigation and, and property reviews. And just so everyone knows, Bob is not working in his pajamas and exactly. he's not quarantined. He actually gets to work out of his house. That's the kind of life you want to lead, right? That's right. I'm, I'm my golden retriever sitting behind me gnawing on his bone. Hopefully you don't hear that through this broadcast. <laughs> we're, we're good. All right, Bob, listen, we, we thank you so much for your time. I know it's a, a difference in, in time zone because you're out there on the West and we're not. Yeah. How's your weather anyway? Good. Weather's good right now. It's been sunny. It's last month we had, I think, 30 days of straight drizzle, and rain. And now we've got a big high, uh, what do they call high pressure cell from Alaska. So it's dropped down into the 30s and they might have snowflakes tomorrow, but it's nice to have yeah, sunshine nice. over here being so far up north. So. so you can actually see Mount Rainier today, huh? Yeah, and the Olympic Mountains. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Again, thank you so much for your yeah, time. You. Yeah. Folks. I appreciate you joining the show today. If you want any information on our fund, it's carolinahardmoney.com. Click on the investor tab and then fill out the form. We'll schedule an appointment. And if you want to talk to Bob about his fund, it is notablefund.com. Notablefund.com. We'll have the URL <laughs> listed in there. And so you won't have to listen to me. You can just click the link. <laughs> Well, I've been messing up all day, haven't I, Bob? <laughs> That's okay, Bill. I appreciate you having me on. And I, I hope that after we uh, we close down this session, you can go take take a nap, get some rest, because <laughs> I know it's like traveling like that. I Thank you, sir. Uh, again, don't forget to share, like, subscribe, all that stuff. See you on the next show, everyone. Hi, if you really like this show, what you can do is you can check out some of our other shows that might or might not pertain to it. You can check up there. You can check over here. You can check down here. Check it out. Don't be afraid to like us, right? Subscribe. <laughs> do that too. Subscribe to our page and hit like. We'd love to have you do that. Thanks.